All right, good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel uh, out here by the ocean. It's gorgeous and uh, and we're just sad that we're not able to be here and to meet here still as a church body. Uh, but we're going to keep doing this as long as we can or until the Lord uh, enables us to be back here and just be praying for Maui County, be praying for the whole crazy COVID situation. Uh, come Lord Jesus, Lord save those people that are in our hearts that that our hearts break for that need to know you lord and at the same time we're just looking forward to his coming and we'll talk a little bit about that this morning here as well but as we enter in here in john 17 verse 14 where we left off a couple weeks ago uh the title if i were to give it a title would be god still speaks and the title that i gave it before that was arrested by jesus and it's awesome because when you look at God's word, that's what it does. It, it apprehends you when you, when, if you will and you truly will see Jesus, he'll capture you. And uh, so again, arrested by Jesus. And we'll see where that fits in here too. Uh, but also God still speaks. And you guys read with me verse 14. And then we're just going to go through a little here and then we'll stop and, and pray in just, just a couple minutes. But listen. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and he began to teach. And the Jews were amazed, verse 15, and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied, without having been schooled? And Jesus answered them, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. And again, as we left off a couple weeks ago, and, and I shared we come back to this statement of Jesus is here. Well, here we are. And in, in the text and in a time in our lives, at least I know for me, probably for, for many, if not most of you, at a time where we need to hear. The world needs to hear from the one who sent Jesus. And the, the, the way that we hear from the one who sent Jesus is we hear from Jesus. And so in that, listen, God still speaks through Jesus, through his word. And we'll see that this morning, I guarantee you. And listen too, I mean, God is blessed. I was thinking about this. I shared this with somebody just yesterday morning. God is blessed when we cry out to him. When we cry out with a broken and contrite heart and we cry out to him, God is blessed when we cry out to him. And he is pleased in that to show us his word. And I can guarantee you that if you've never been, if you've never experienced that place of God giving you a word from his word and then confirming it through others, then you know what? You need to, number one, get in the Word more. And you need to maybe as well get around others that are in the Word more. Because that's how it works. You know, you, you can't give what you don't have. And, and you know, guys, and God has so much for us. On Friday morning, I don't have time to go into the details of it because we got a, a lot to cover here. But I'll tell you, Friday morning, Saturday, the, the, the word that the Lord gave to, to me, to our family, in different ways was just amazing. You know, talk about strength and help in time of need. That's our Lord, and, and it comes from his word. And so I encourage you this morning uh, to heed, to hear maybe what God wants to speak to you, what you need this morning. So Jesus had come to the Feast of Tabernacles in our text. We saw that a few weeks ago. It's there, it's Jerusalem. It's a huge feast, a favorite feast. There's millions of Jews, literally millions of Jews visiting here at this time. And so, he, but he came, we were told kind of quietly, uh, which you could do because there's millions of people. So you could come in and, and not be seen so much, except for there's those that were looking for him. There's those that were looking for him that, that loved him. They wanted to be touched by him. And there's those that, that, that hated him and they wanted to get their hands on him and and so about midweek through the feast we're told that Jesus went went out to the street corners and began to teach that isn't what he did Jesus went straight into the the heat he went straight into the temple and he starts to teach I love this that's our Lord he has no fear and he's gonna accomplish God's plan and he's loud when he's there he's not you know, he's, we're going to see a few times how he cried out to the crowds that were there with the priests and everyone else watching. You guys, maybe there's people in your life that you need to cry out to. You know, get God in that right place in your life. And, and that's part of it, though, because you see, if you remember, 
Jesus, as he cries out this time, it's different from one of the last times. In John chapter 2, we studied it there when Jesus went to Jerusalem. He cleared the temple that time, but not with his teaching, but he did it with a whip. He literally cleaned his father's house by running out those things that didn't belong. And this time, though, here he comes with the word, the sword of the word, rather than a whip in the hand. And if you think about this, as I was, seems like this is the way that oftentimes Jesus works in our lives. As Christians, if you are today, you know this. Before God can get his word into you completely effectively, there's got to be a cleansing that goes on completely internally. And certain things that maybe have crept into your life that don't belong need to be driven out before you're ever going to really grow and benefit from God's word what we want so much and that's why it's important for us as we even studying the word this morning or anytime we gather together or just to sit on my own at home and open up my bible and read i need to invite the lord i need to invite him to his temple and and to say lord come search my heart remove whatever is not pleasing to you show me whatever needs to be confessed to you and and turned away from in my heart as i turn towards you in my spirit because your spirit, as much as you want to turn towards him, you know, if there's something in the way, if there's something that doesn't belong, that you're allowing to take that place, then you're not going to hear. Psalm 66 verse 18 tells us very clearly, if I cherish the sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I cherish the sin in my heart, another translation, he doesn't listen because because he's waiting. Listen, do you, have, do you ever feel like the Lord isn't listening? Probably so. I'm sure there's times, as there has been in my life, where, you know, does he hear me? Lord, do you hear? And, and, and I think it's those times are when I just don't understand his timing because he is listening. He does care. We know that. But maybe as it's been for me, maybe for you right now, I don't know, but listen, maybe he's already told you things that you know that he's told you to get rid of, but you're hanging on to them and, and you're avoiding him basically if you're hanging on to them. And maybe it seems like he's not listening or doesn't hear because he knows that you know that there are tables in your heart that he's called you to clear. But in ignoring his voice, he's waiting for you to ask for his help, to, to permanently make a place to clear a place for him on the throne in your heart and it's so important because if you don't he won't if you want to hang on again if you cherish the sin in your heart you, you don't have room for the lord an unconfessed sin or unrepented of sin cherish sin basically if i hang on to it listen the word will not affect me as it should as it could as god would as he wants and all because God loves me too much to let me just pile up and cling to the sin in my life that would separate me from him. You guys, basically, he allows me to be miserable for a time, for a season. He'll break that connection until I make a move for confession. You guys, that's where he is. He says, call on me. Come to me. You know, let me clean your temple first. Then I'll teach you. Then you'll hear my voice. Then we can move ahead. But, but not until then. And so let's pray again and then we'll move ahead. But I just want to encourage you, maybe right now it's time to, to confess something, to lay it before the Lord again and say, God, I want to hear from you this morning. So Lord, I ask you to, to cleanse me. Show me if there's any wicked way. Let me turn away right now. So let's pray. Father, we come before you. And God, just ask you to show us if there's anything that needs to go, Lord, before you can come in your fullness even right now this morning, Lord, it's just a prayer away. Lord, you're fast. You cleanse, you heal, you touch, Lord, completely and quickly, Lord. We know you can. And so we ask you now to move in us. Lord, for any right now that are turning to you, Lord, let them, let them see your face now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so verse 15, and we're going to go fast. I know I say that a lot, but that's what we do. The Jews, verse 15, were amazed and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? You know, he wasn't, he hadn't been taught by any of the prominent rabbis, you know. I mean, like, like Paul was known to have served under and, and learned under Gamaliel, you know, and, and that school. But here, for Jesus, not so. 
And if you remember in Acts 14, verse 13, I love it there because it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John. It wasn't just like these guys had courage. No, it could be seen. That's what I want. I want people to see my courage when it comes to Jesus. But listen, it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And it says, they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And again, I love this. Too good. God takes the uneducated and he makes them the educators. You know, and how many times has God done this with just unschooled, ordinary men? I mean, so many pastors, when you look at, you know, Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody and F.B. Meyer and, and so many of these guys that are just the, the guys that we, we look to and go, man, you know, what a, what a man of God. And we find, you know what, they never went to seminary. They never went to Bible college. But they started seminaries. I mean, that's our God. How does it happen? It's spending time. You guys, it comes down for every one of us. Spending time with Jesus. If you want to affect others for him, then spend time with him. And then when, when you're spending time with him, then when you share of him, it will be of your own relationship and not just what somebody else has told you of him. And, and that's effective. That's the difference between a real Christian sharing their heart with someone and somebody who you know, goes to church that just wants to, to, to win you to their chapter or, or, or church of choice. Look at verse 16 again, what Jesus did. He answers, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. Jesus spent time with the Father. Once more, my goal as a pastor the goal of teachers, the, the goal for every just believer sharing God's word, our great desire needs to be that, that our teaching, that our sharing won't be our own. But it would be his word affecting others by his spirit because it's that inner work that every soul desperately needs. Other words, other ways, it's just words. Other, other ways, it's just, you know, pouring out, well, the things that I think rather than the things that God has said. We see the prophets in Ezekiel doing that, where they say, you know, well, thus saith the Lord, and God says, I never said that. You guys, when it's Jesus, people will know that you've spent time with him. And it will be known again in a couple of ways. First, I love it, it's, it's make, God makes himself known to you. He makes himself known to you. And you know, God's spirit bearing witness to you within you as, as he speaks. In John, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, I'm writing these things to you, John says, about those who are trying to lead you astray. He says, as for you, the anointing that you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but his anointing teaches you about all these things and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, not made up, he says, as that anointing has taught you, remain in him. I mean, the anointing, how does the anointing teach you to remain in him? It's like that understanding when God's moving in your life, you want to keep moving with God in your life. And, and, and so what do you do? Well, you need to stay close to Jesus. You need to remain in him, abide in him. And then his spirit bears witness with your own as to his word for you and in others. Nothing better. As a pastor, if that's not happening, then, you know, pull the plug already. None of this is worth it. But when God speaks, you guys, as we do and we trust in his anointing, listen, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul said, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. And so, well, well, how do we trust prophecy and how do we know the anointing? Again, we need to be close to Jesus. We need to be close to his word. And, and, and the difference between those who are truly called and anointed to lead you and the difference between those who are maybe knowing it or not but are trying to lead you astray, and there are many today, it'll be understood, again, by our time in the word. When someone speaks and we can say, no, I don't think so. Because we know our Lord and that's not him and it's not his word. Listen, prophets come to town and people say, hey, just raise your hands and praise God, you know. But God says, no way. He says, bury your head in prayer, bury your heart in the word of God and, and, and question the prophet. Really? Yeah, well, how do you know if he really is a prophet unless you 
test unless you question because there are those and we see it many places that are trying to lead you astray even as we just read. And Paul goes on and he tells us in the very next, next verse how we're to do that. In verse five, or 21 of chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, we're told test everything and hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. You guys, it speaks for itself, but to bring in a little more to that thought, where it says test everything, everything there in the Greek is the word pas, P-A-S. And it has so much more meaning than just everything as we would think of everything. Everything means everything, everything, everyone, all respects, and it's given in the perfect tense denoting always consistently and continually testing everything. That's what we do, why? Because the enemy, the devil, prowls around like, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy, and how does he do it? Well, he leads people astray. Number one way that the devil, that the devil destroys people is he gets them off the path. Hey, did God really say? Check it out over here. And I mean, that's how he works. And so we're to test everything re with regards to that which is evil. At the same time, he says, hold on to good. Hold on, as you're testing it and you find out this is good, this is God. You know what, then the Greek word there tells us basically not just hold on, but it's, it's to take possession of. It's to, it's to hold on to as to, to, to own and to not let go. Hang on to the good in that way. Listen, is there good that God's spoken to you in your life lately? Scriptures like that he's given to me and my family as I shared with you a little while ago. You guys, hang on, take possession of those things. It can, if it can be confirmed in your heart, and again, with Scripture to Scripture, that it's the Lord, then hang on to that. How do we test everything again? Well, we ask for wisdom. We know that. James chapter 1, verse 5. Ask for wisdom. And then with that wisdom, with the Holy Spirit's connection and the, the Holy Scripture's direction, what we do is we walk. And we do this. We either walk forward or we walk away. That's what happens. When we test, we know. Hang on to the good. Walk forward. Every kind of evil, walk away. If anyone chooses, look at verse 17, Jesus says, if anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out, he will know whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Especially now, here Jesus' teaching is being brought into question here. So he said, hey, you want to see if, 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 I'm, if my teaching is from God? If your heart's in the right place, you're truly choosing to do God's will, you'll know whether I speak from God or on my own. Some will say, many do, I believe in God, but I just don't follow the whole Jesus thing. I mean, I, I'm a child of God, you know, sure, but I'm not a Christian, you know, and, you know, that's for, that's for others. You guys, if you ever run into those, listen, understand, or maybe hopefully not that that describes you. Listen very, 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 very carefully. For any who truly think that, that you're choosing to do God's will and to the best of your ability, you're trying to live your life as God would have you to, listen, you can't without Jesus. And, and, and Jesus says, listen, you'll find out whether his teaching came from God or not. And if he was speaking on his own, if you truly want to follow God, you'll check out his teaching. That's what he's telling us. And so for those that truly want to follow God, they would check out his teaching. And here's the thing, for any that would check, truly check out the teaching of Jesus, I know any that would honestly search the scriptures to see if those words in red are really the voice of God or just a man, if anybody would seriously, genuinely look at Jesus Christ, what he said, go through the scriptures, even Old Testament, you guys, suddenly, surely, with a heart after God, you will see Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, exactly who the prophets, even of Leviticus, as Moses spoke the law there in Leviticus, you'll see he's God. Jesus is God in the flesh, just exactly as he's telling these guys. And there's another application here for believers as well, okay? What we see here is that our revelation is directly linked to our application. Our revelation is linked to our application. If you truly choose to do God's will by following the teachings of Jesus Christ, you'll learn more and more about Jesus Christ. You will. How? Again, revelation of God, of his plan, is linked to application. Your walks and your works. Now this is not saying that salvation is by works. No, it's by grace alone, guaranteed. But the more you do work, the more you'll see him work. You'll see the application. You follow him closely, listen, you'll see him moving before you. 
One commentator wrote this, I love it. Obedience is the door through which revelation enters. You know, it basically, you know, you go, then you'll know. Obedience is the door through which revelation enters. Well, what kind of, how do I get revelation? Well, be obedient. Obedient to what? Tell me what to do. Read your Bible. Just like God has said. Don't neglect the, the gathering of the saints. This is the habit of some. You know, we've talked about that so many times. It's like, you know, and people hear it, and what do they do? They tune it out. You tune it out. I don't want to hear that scripture. That tells me I need to be at Bible study on Wednesday night. That tells me that I need to get up and spend time in the Word before I spend time doing everything else. Listen, yeah, that's how God works. You, you want Him to work in your life, then you work the way that He says. It's, it's through His Word. It's by His Word. And I love this because when you get into this place, you find out it's not an easy place. I want to know His plan. I want to know his direction. And here's the thing, as much as I want to know and we should want to know, it doesn't usually come fast. It rarely comes easily. And I think that, that, that that's why this is, this is called the Christian walk. You've probably heard it said that it's, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon, you know? And what happens with marathons? Not many, not many make it to the end sometimes. A lot of people give up. Many people, many runners will never ever run a marathon. They're in for the sprint. And I think God calls us to be those that are in for the, for the marathon. And at the same time, there's gonna be sprinting along the way. As you're walking through the refiner's fire and you wanna get out as fast as you possibly can. You know, there's a reason they don't call it, you know, they call it the Christian walk and, and not the Christian skip. You know, you don't see a lot of people, you know. I mean, you may, you may skip some with the Lord, times that you enjoy. At the same time, you know, it's, it's, you don't hear about the Christian dance, though. You guys, there's times where, again, where, you know, where his pleasures are evermore and our joy is fulfilled in him, you guys, as the scripture says. But at the same time, you guys, it's that walk that gets us to the place where Jesus has and waits for us. And, and he lays it out for us here, the reality of it, really, you want people to see and Jesus now speaking of himself in verse 18 we read he who speaks on his own Jesus says he does so to gain honor for himself the one that speaks on his own wants the honor so he's speaking everybody listen to me but here it is he who works for the honor of the one who sent him he is a man of truth and there is nothing false about him and again Jesus is speaking of himself here you know at the same time that's when Jesus is in the right place. When you're doing it for him, when you, when you, when you continue, and, and it's not because you want to be heard and you want to be seen, but it's because you want him to be heard and you trust that he'll be seen. And the scriptures are clear. There's nothing false about him. So we don't have to fear. We, you know, so many times people, I talked with somebody just the other day, you know, that said they were talking about afraid to share their faith with people and with, with close friends even because of, well, they might laugh at them or whatever. Listen, there's nothing to laugh at here. The enemy wants to tell you, yeah, yeah, you're, you know, you know, listen, there's nothing false about Jesus Christ. There's not a proud bone in his body. If anybody could ever be proud, it was Jesus. I mean, he's the creator of heaven and earth, you know, and, and I look at this and I think like, all throughout the Gospels, what do you see of Jesus? He's glorifying the Father. What do you see of Jesus? He's doing only what the Father tells him, speaking only as the Father speaks to him. He's revealing the Father. And so you read the word and it's very clear, Jesus was not out to gain honor for himself. We talked about it two weeks ago. His brothers thought he was. Hey, you know, if you're all that, man, why don't you go to Jerusalem? Show yourself to your people, you know? I mean, verses three and four of chapter seven here. Why would they say that? They're jealous. They're, they're just jealous. I mean, it's like, but, but again, they go. The amazing gift of God and Jesus is, you know, he, he's got a, a heart that forgives. Here are his brothers. Those that, that to a degree, look, they're basically mocking him. Later they'll worship him and, and he'll receive that worship. And he won't tell him, hey, remember when you guys were making fun of me? Remember when you guys were saying, hey, go and show yourself. What do you think of yourself now, huh? Raised from the dead, here he is and stands before him. No, he just, he just loves him. That's who he is. He knows how fickle and how faulty and fake we can be, and, but yet he loves us. Even as a young boy, you know, what did he do? about his father's business. 
parents are looking for him. They're heading home from one of the feasts, and, and where's Jesus? And they, they thought he's one of the relatives, and they go back, and they find him. There he is in the temple, and the courts of the temple, and he's teaching and sharing with the, with the, the rabbis that are there, you guys. Yeah, I had to be about my father's business. I love it. For the Jews of Jesus' own day, nothing they could say would stick. All they had were lies, even still today. You think about it, Jewish historian Josephus had it right. Jo Flavius Josephus, great name, Flavius Josephus. He, in first century, the first century, he wrote this, among many other things about Jesus, he wrote, he was a good man. He was a good man who did many miracles, and I love it, among the common folk. He didn't go out for the rich, you know, to try to make a name for himself, but he, but he went to the common folk that would receive him gladly. And he did many miracles. Listen, he was a man of truth, nothing false about him. Three times, Pilate would question him, and he'd say, I, I find no fault, no basis even for a charge against him. Then as Jesus stood before the Pharisees and the high priest after his arrest, being questioned in John 18, 20, you can turn there quickly if you want, just turn to the right a few pages, chapter 18, verse 20. Jesus replied, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues. I taught at the temple where all the Jews come together. And I said nothing in secret. Why question me? He says, ask those who heard me. I love that. Surely they know what I said. I mean, what a great way to be able to respond, you know, that, hey, you know, go back, you know, for, hey, go back and listen to the last week's video. Go back and, 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 and watch last week's teaching, you know, and, and, and see if, 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 if I spoke anything wrong. But look at this. Jesus, even more so, why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. And when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. He says, is this the way that you answer the high priest? He demanded, and Jesus replied, if I said something wrong, you know, probably, you know, whoa, if I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? And, 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 and they couldn't answer him. You see, that's the thing. They couldn't answer him, so they struck him. You know, and here again, hey, is this the way you answer the high priest? Man, Jesus could have. He's not proud, though. He's, you know, his timing was, was, was perfect, that he must go to the cross. He could have, though. He could have right there. I would have. See, that's why I'm no Jesus. But I, he could have. He could have said, listen, I am the high priest. I am the fulfillment of the high priest. From Aaron to Caiaphas, I am the fulfillment of everything that you see. As the high priest goes into the, to the, to the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and goes and takes the blood there in there and puts it on the altar. Listen, I am that high priest, but I go with my own blood. I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the... I mean, he could have put that guy in his place. I'm the high priest. You struck me. I strike you. I mean, but he doesn't do that. He's kind. He's gracious. Even in this. You know, listen... I don't think Jesus replied in verse 23, if I said something wrong, tell me what's wrong. If I spoke the truth, why do you strike? He's not, Jesus keeps his cool. Jesus, listen, they, that's why they couldn't answer him. There was, there was nothing but truth in this man. He says in verse 18, again, we see it there, nothing false about him still today. People bash him, testify as to what he said is wrong. They can't, no one can you guys, what we hold in our hands here this morning is ultimate truth, and the devil hates it. And he hates churches that teach it. The Bible and Jesus Christ will stand up to any, all scrutiny. Listen, where are all the books? Where are all the books that prove this wrong? If the world is so wise in all of their ways and so many mock and deny Jesus Christ, where are all the books? Show me one that can prove this book wrong. You can't, there's not. Because it's truth. Jesus walked his walk. And listen, as unpopular as it was for him with the religious leaders, even his family, gosh, Jesus went about his father's business. He did his job. He served man. He's God. He came to serve man. Praise God for that, you guys. And then look here at verse 19. Jesus says to them, listen, he is, has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? I mean, and, and at this, verse 20, why, why you're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. 
You know, who's trying to kill you? You know, they're thinking, you're nuts. Who's trying to kill you? Well, the crowd. Well, they're, they're wondering, why would he say this? Well, because they're wondering, because Jesus isn't from, they're, they're not from there. They're, within this crowd, there are few, comparatively, that lived in Jerusalem that would have known what was going on with the priests of that day and the happenings of Jesus and how they wanted to kill him. But we've already read, we've studied, we've seen that it was known that they wanted to kill him. And so but the, for the crowds that were there, they're thinking, this guy, he's teaching, he's teaching against it. What's going on here, you know? Why, who's trying to kill you, buddy? You know, they didn't know. They're from out of town. I mean, you wouldn't know. My hurts, my pains, who is out after me at times or something like that. Listen, so here he is, and, and he says to them, speaking to the leaders that are there so much, so I did one miracle, and you're all astonished. You know, surely he had done many other miracles. We know that already. That's why the crowds followed him. If he'd only done one, they'd be like, ah, they'd forget about him. But no, he'd done many miracles. He healed the sick. He'd been, you know, touching and, 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 and casting out demons and his disciples as well along the way. Amazing. And his teaching, blowing people's minds everywhere he went. So he says to them, I did one miracle. Of course, he's speaking to the invalid that was there from chapter 5 we saw as he healed him on the Sabbath, remember? 38 years he'd been an invalid and Jesus heals him completely. So he says, I, I've done this, and you're all astonished. Yet, verse 22, because Moses gave you circumcision, you know, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, but because Moses gave you circumcision, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath, you know, which is when he had healed that man on the Sabbath, right? He says, now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? And here it is, verse 24. Stop judging by mere appearances and use your head. It's, uh, that basically, he says, make a right judgment. You know, think, make a right judgment. So, so, so God's call to the world today as well. You know, stop judging by appearance. Make a right judgment. But listen, listen, if, if, if you aren't open or you, you truly don't have God's heart, you can't make a right judgment. It, it, you, you walk in foolishness. And so Jesus is here saying, he goes, listen, you guys, you don't have a problem with someone causing pain on the Sabbath, with someone taking away circumcision on the Sabbath. But here, because I brought joy, because I restored on the Sabbath, you're all upset. It, basically, it, it doesn't really make any sense that you can circumcise on the Sabbath, but I can't heal someone on the Sabbath. I mean, duh, you guys make a right judgment. Come on. And so this is typical, though. I was thinking of the world and view of religion today, especially Christianity. I mean, many in the world think if you're really spiritual, if you're truly, you know, a Christian, these Christians, you, you can't have fun on Sunday. You can't go to church and actually enjoy it. Church isn't enjoyable. Church has to be a little painful, you know. Come on. It has to be a little painful. If it's religion, you got to kind of tough your way through it, right? You know? Sit, stand, kneel, repeat, you know, back and forth. You know, it's like, that's not it. God's heart, Jesus, again, making a right judgment, looking at Jesus. Jesus is about revelation. Not the book of, surely so, but, but revealing. He's about restoring. He's about joy. He's about real peace. Peace that only a Christian can know and when we need it. Peace that's unexplainable, but unless you've known it. And still, you can't explain it. But peace that surpasses our understanding. Peace that I need, that we need. And it comes when you know Him. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, Ephesians 3, 16, Paul says this, I love this, listen carefully. Write, the, write this down, note it, memorize it, whatever you can. In Ephesians 3.16, Paul writes, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. You ever want a prayer for somebody? Here you go. Here you go, man. I pray that out of his, God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you may be rooted and established in love your roots are in and you ain't going nowhere in love that you might have power together with all the saints to grasp here it is how wide how long how high how deep is the love of jesus christ 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the full measure of all the fullness of God. You guys, not religion, the fullness of God. I mean, that's, that's God's heart. That's his heart. That's what he wants for you. You know, and to deny that is to deny him and giving you pleasure with his full measure. I mean, that's what he wants. He wants to give you his pleasure, not the pleasures of this world that you and I run after, but, but the fullness of God in Jesus Christ. Love that surpasses knowledge. The psalmist had it wired, again, kind of mentioned it a moment ago, in Psalm 16, verse 11, where he wrote, In your presence, Lord, is fullness of joy. It's in God's presence. In your right hand, there are pleasures evermore. And so here's the deal. Scrutinize Jesus. Scrutinize him to the T. You know, go at it. Go ahead. But, but if you do, get over it because he wants you to enjoy him. And his words to us are stop judging by appearances, by what you think, you know, what, you, what you've been told. We'll see in a moment. Make a right judgment. How do you make a right judgment? Again, we got to go to the Word. We got to go to the Word. That's where we see what's true and what's right. So look at verse 25, and we'll see why in a moment very clearly here. Listen, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask. So now the people of Jerusalem that know what's been going on, right? They're asking, hey, isn't this the man that they are trying to kill? Isn't this the man that they are trying to kill? Here he is. He's speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. And I love this. It says, have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? So these guys from Jerusalem, knowing that he's like, wait a minute. This is the guy they've been waiting all week to get their hands on. And here he is in the temple, in their lap. He's teaching. Why don't they grab him? Why don't they stop him? Why is he still speaking? Do you think that maybe they believe now he is the Messiah? And, and so they're probably getting kind of excited. And but look at verse 27. Here's what happens. Some guy, somebody, who knows. But wait, we know where this man is from. And when the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. Oh, really? Where'd you hear that? In some confused, convoluted Sunday school class? You know, that's not in the Bible. I mean, you see, that's the thing. People say things that they've heard. Well, I, well I've heard that this, you know, well, wh what's the Bible say? Talked with many Catholics, you know, talked with one this morning, you know, stuff that I heard and what I learned. Listen, you know, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you need to sit, stand, kneel, say this, say that, you know, and then, you know, touch the robe of, of, the, of the, the priest or, or, or carry his stuff for him or, or, or call someone Holy Father. I mean, give me a break. You guys, you know, and not to just bent on Catholicism, but there's so much of religion, you guys, that... They're not teaching from the Bible, and so no one really knows. And so when someone says, well, no one will really know where he's from, people go, oh, yeah, really, that's true. No, it's not. No, it's not. They're, they're thinking maybe this is him. But someone wrongly remembered or purposely, you know, spoke and said, no one would know where he's from. And how many times the, the, the unknowing heads nod and agree, oh, yeah, that's true. No, where is that from? The prophets were clear. The prophets were very clear. Born in Bethlehem Ephratha, and he would be called a Nazarene. Just as he was born in Bethlehem, but he would be raised in Nazareth. And so verse 28, still teaching in the temple courts, I love it, he cried out. Everybody knew where he was. Everybody knew who he was. And he says, yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. But kind of did they. You got to wonder, well, they thought they did. They probably thought, well, yeah, he's that Mary and Joseph's son. We heard about him. You know, he's the one from Nazareth. Yeah, but, but th listen, they were only half right on who he was and all wrong on where he was from. Jesus, he says, listen, I'm not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You don't even know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. I mean, I'm not here on my own. He's not just talking about here at the temple today. He's talking about being on that earth at that time, sent by God. Listen, you think you know me, you think you know where I'm from, but really you don't know me at all and you really don't have a clue where I'm from. And watch, and he'll explain this to them, why they don't know him. It's basically they, because they don't know the Father. 
If they knew the Father, they'd know Him. Listen, people starting to listen, leaders starting to lose it there. In verse 30, at this, they tried to seize Him. I mean, they knew when, when, he, when Jesus said, the rabbis and, and the, the priests that were there, when He said, I am from Him, He sent me, those guys knew. He's saying again that he's from God, therefore he's saying he is God. So verse 30 again, people listening, leaders losing it. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. And they had to go after him because the people had just said, Hey, do you think they've concluded he's Jesus? He's here. They're not saying a word to him. You know, because they didn't have any words to stand up to him. So what do they do? Try to take him out but his time had not yet come. So verse 31, they'd have their day, but then Jesus would show them it was his day. Verse 31, still many in the crowd put their faith in him. I love that. They said, when the Christ comes, come on, will, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? I mean, these, the, there were those in the crowd that knew of all of the, the works that Jesus had done and how he had healed and, and raised the dead and, 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 and brought salvation to so many and from demonic uh, captivity and experience there, possession. And so verse 32, verse, when, the th when the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things, come on, you know, anybody can do this? They're putting their faith in him. They heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees, they sent the temple guard to arrest him. And this is cool. You know, they already tried to grab him. They can't get him. So they send the temple guard. These guys, they're going to do it. They work for us. And I love this part because here the Pharisees, as they send them out to arrest Jesus, these guys, as I'd said, they're arrested by him. They're apprehended by Jesus' teaching, basically. And we'll look at it next week in more detail. But they come back and they say, why didn't you bring him in? Why didn't you bring him in? And they said, well, no one ever spoke the way this man does. You know, they, they couldn't. They couldn't stop him, you know. They, you can't stop God. And so he tells them in verse 33, Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time. And then I go to the one who sent me. And you'll look for me, but you'll not find me. And where I am going, you cannot come. Listen, listen. He says, the, and the Jews said to one another, what's he talking about? Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go to where our people live scattered among the Greeks? Teach the Greeks? Is he going to go be a missionary somewhere? What, what did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you won't find me. And where I am, you cannot come. They totally misunderstood his message. Listen, because they misinterpreted his mission. That's where it falls. You know, they misunderstood the message because they misinterpreted the mission. He came for them. They didn't even realize he had come to apprehend them and they're trying to apprehend him. He came for us. He came for everybody that would receive him. He came for the people, not for the power. He had the power and he gave it up. He, he, he was God and he gave up his rights as God and came and lived as a man. Humbled himself and lived for us. You guys, he, he came to leave and then to come back again. We'll see that in a moment. But you guys, this is interesting, especially when you contrast this with these unbelievers that were after him, wanting to destroy him. When you contrast that with what he says to his disciples, those that loved him in John 14. Go ahead, turn to John 14. Turn ahead, real quick, turn there. And, uh, and notice here, this is awesome. As you're turning there, listen. John 14. Listen, for those that didn't want anything to do with Jesus, we just mentioned it. He says, basically, you guys are in trouble. You don't know me, you don't know the Father, you don't look for me, you won't find me, and you can't come where I'm going. But to his disciples, in verse 1 of chapter 14, those that did love him, Jesus says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I am going there to prepare a place for you. And... If I go to a prepared place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Guys, that's his plan. He wants us to be with him. You know, in John chapter 3, when, I mean, in, uh, in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus is 
calling his disciples, it says he called them to himself because he wanted them that they would be with him. In Leviticus, in chapter 20, you know, the, the chapters that we see speak to the holiness of God and God saying himself, you be holy because I am holy, you be holy. And in the end of chapter 20, he talks about, I want you to be holy because I am holy. And it's all, again, we see that he might be with us, that we might be one with him. That's his heart. It's, it's, his, it's what he wants. And so as he tells these guys, I want you to be with me that you may also be where I am. In John 14, verse 4, then he says, and you know the way to the place that I'm going. And so this is cool. I mean, those, to those that love him, Jesus says, no trouble for you. You know me. You know the Father. I'll come back. I'm going to take you to be with me. You know the way to where I'm going. And so important, Jesus still works the same way today with those that love him. And the same way today with those that don't. For those that don't, he says, you're in trouble. You don't know me. You don't know the Father. You'll look for me and not find me. And you can't come where I'm going. But again, for we who do that love him, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, verse 3 of John chapter 14, I will come back and I will take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. And verse 4, you know the way to the place where I'm going. You know the way to the place where he's going? You know what? One way, the way that I, that I hope for, is the rapture of the church. That's the way to the place where, where he's going. That he's going, he's going to heaven and he's going to call his church out to heaven. That's, that's the one way, but that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is very clearly knowing him, that he is the way. Listen carefully, Thomas, old Thomas, I mean, known for being, I mean, they, he's, been, he's been dubbed, the, given the nickname Doubting Thomas. I think really he's more, more honest Thomas than a lot of people would think. He's, he said things, I believe, and asked questions that others probably were thinking and were afraid to, to ask. But this morning, maybe you're in that place. Maybe you don't really, I, don't, I want to know the way. Do you know the way to the place where I'm going? Listen, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, and the same answer that he gives to all that will truly listen today, for all that will carefully test his teaching today, for those that will make a right judgment. Look at Jesus, test his word. Jesus says, Thomas, he says, I am. I am the way. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no one comes to the Father, no one, except through me. So basically, you know me, and you know the Father, and I'm the way. And so, if these words are true, and they are, then the world is in trouble. Because it doesn't know Jesus. It doesn't know the Father. It denies Him. The world can't go where Jesus has gone because the world has turned away from, from, from heaven and turned their eyes on earth to bring their fulfillment. The only way is Jesus. And just as He said, again, the world is truly in trouble. And so listen very, very carefully here. Listen, if you count yourself enlightened of the world this morning you talk to people like oh you're you're a pastor oh yeah well, i i used to be religious like that too but now i now you what now you know better than than the bible i mean that's where i take them don't take them to your church to your you know your thoughts your anything make them make a right judgment bring them to that place where so if you're enlightened well then how are you enlightened and, and, and my book says you're not. Prove my book wrong, let me prove yours. He goes, listen, again, there's, there's not a book that can be written to refute the counsel and the heart of Jesus Christ. Many have, have tried, and at the same time, it's fallen on dead ears, not just deaf. But graves are full of men that, that through their fist at God. Voltaire, one who you know, famous writer, French Voltaire, and in one of his books and in many of his conversations and things that he was noted for was that his writings will outlive the Bible and the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's what he thought. It wasn't it long after his death that they started printing Bibles on the same presses they used to print out his books. Jesus says, listen, Make a right judgment. Stop looking at 
the appearance, the mere appearance of misguided religions or the misguided religious or even the appearance of the church because there's so much wrong with so much of the church. You say, just look at Jesus Christ. Look at me. Come to me. You're weary, you're heavy laden. Look at the Bible. Make a right judgment. And here's the deal. I have no doubt if anyone will, they'll find that Jesus, he's a man of truth. Nothing false in him. Even as, as, as Flavius Josephus said, you know, he was a good man. None like him. And Jesus is waiting. He's the way. And yet he waits. Call on me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, as we said. You're tired. You're bummed out. You're done. Jesus is our rest. You see that he's, he's the fulfillment of the Sabbath, Jesus is. He is our rest. And Jesus says, call on me. Come to me. Let's clean your temple. Then I'll teach you. Then you'll hear my voice. And then we'll move ahead. But not until then. Jesus says, listen, what is holding you back from my love? And that's what it is. You need to ask yourself today. If you're not walking in the love of Jesus Christ, what is there that's holding you back? What other loves are in your way? What other loves are there in this world that have taken a place that only Jesus can have, that, that Jesus has, has, was born to hold as King of kings and Lord of lords? In Revelation 19, it says that when Jesus comes back and he's going to have written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Is he your Lord? Is he your love? In Revelation chapter you know, 3, he was speaking to the church there at Ephesus and he says, hey, you're doing all these great things. Wonderful life. I've seen it. The world sees you guys. You're, you look awesome. But he says, listen, I have this one thing against you. You've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten me. And then I love the words he says, and I love the way the NIV recalls it. It says that he says then after that, you've forgotten your first love, you know. He says, he says, remember the height from which you've fallen. He doesn't say, look at how low you've sunk. Look at how far away from me you've gotten. No, he says, remember the height. Remember, he says, basically, remember how good it was. Listen, if you're in that place now, then, then, then get back to that place where life is its best. Not just good, but where it is at its best. In Jesus. Verse 37, on the last, the greatest day of the feast, here he is again, Jesus stood up and he said in a loud voice, he's again, there's no denying that he, was, he, was, he wasn't hiding. If anyone is thirsty, he said, let him come to me and let him drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Jesus lays out the promise. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit. John tells us right after that in verse 39, by this he meant the Spirit. What's this again? Come to me, drink, believe, and streams of living water, you'll have that overwhelming, overflowing work of the Spirit within your life. By this he meant the Spirit, John says, what we've been talking about this morning. By this he meant the Spirit. Whom, whom, he's a person. He's not just a power, some mystical power. It's a whom by whom those who believed in him were later to receive. It says up to that point in time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus was speaking of something that was to come. Now we read it and we look, it's come. It's already happened. Jesus has been glorified. That promise is for us, for all who will call on his name, for everyone here today that's listening. Jesus said it is finished. The Bible shows us that at the cross, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and access is made into the Holy of Holies, that place where Christ would dwell with man forever. And I look and I think, gosh, all that what? That we'd be forgiven. He died in our place so that we could be forgiven and that we could know him, that we could have a relationship with him. It's what he wants. It's what he died for. And all that we could know him at the same time that we could represent him. Because if you're thirsty and you come to Jesus and drink, and as the scriptures have said, streams of living water are gonna flow from within you, you know what, that's gonna be seen. You will be different from those other Christians around the world that are by name, but not by spirit. And Jesus is waiting and Jesus is wanting. For some of you maybe listening this morning, they're online and watching online, wherever is listen. He says, I want you to, I want you to to truly open up so that I can fully come in. And once I fully come in, I'm gonna to wanna to completely clean up. I'm not gonna to wanna to dwell with all these things that you've allowed, but once that happens, then I will show up and I will touch others with your life. 
And again, there's nothing better than seeing God touch others through your life. That overflowing work of the Holy Spirit. Why is it overflowing? Why is it streams of living water flowing from within? That means they're going somewhere. It's because God wants to touch others with his spirit through your life and mine. If God's not touching others with his spirit through your life, you listen, it's what he wants to do. It's what you are to receive. And so I encourage you this morning, if you haven't, it's time. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. He'll do it. He does it in you. I don't have to grunt and groan and try to make things happen. He will bring it to pass. And closing up with this, verse 40, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Christ. Still others asked, how can the Christ come from Galilee? And still, does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family line and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Listen, yes it does. That's exactly what it says. But it tells us that thus the people were divided because of Jesus. How were they divided? Those that would taste and see, that would test and look at the scriptures to see that, you know what, Jesus did come from David's family line. He's the son of David. At the same time, he was born in Bethlehem. And he was not just born in Bethlehem, but in a manger that he might be born again, humbly in the hearts of those who would believe, everyone. And to be here with us this morning, to meet us where we are, right now for what I need. I have needs, guaranteed. You guys, I have needs, and I'm so thankful that I have Jesus. I'm sure you guys listening, whatever, you have needs. You know what? Do you have Jesus? He waits. And, if, and he's going to meet your needs, you guys, first and foremost, by a work of his spirit. The spirit that comes and says, trust me, taste and see that I'm good. The spirit that says, make a right judgment. The spirit that says, listen, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone answers the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. The spirit of Jesus that says, listen, trust in me with all your heart now. Think not on the way they say it must be. In all your ways, recognize me. And watch yourself walk on water with Jesus. Watch him do the impossible. He's God. There's nothing impossible. What you're facing right now, there is nothing impossible for God. Trust him. Cling to him. Hear his word. Study his word. Read his word. Relate to it. Ask him to speak and place it in your heart and then let him confirm it through others that hold his word as well. Best thing going until he comes. Until we're gone. Amen? Hey, let's, let's pray and commit this to the Lord. Father, we thank you again. Thank you for this morning. Lord, just thank you for your word. Thank you for being able to, in the midst of all the COVID craziness, still be able to come down here, even just a couple of us, to do this. Lord, we pray that you would bear fruit from your word because it's good. Touch lives, stir hearts. Lord, encourage, Lord, those that are brokenhearted and, and heal those that have physical needs, Lord. Meet the, the financial stress and strife of life. And Lord, you don't let your children go hungry for begging for bread, but you have a plan for us, each one. And in these dark hours of these last days, Lord, let our light so shine. Your spirit within us, God. Let our light so shine before men that they might see your good works, you, Holy Spirit, and glorify our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.